Sure. I'm here with Kaimako Ru. He is the Minister of ICT and Trade from Estonia company, uh, country <laughs> company. I'm here with Kaima Karu. He's the Minister of ICT and Trade uh, of Estonia, a country which I visited many times, and I am also a digital citizen of that country, and we're going to talk about him as a background. He has a background in software. We're going to talk about how it is to be in software and then to be a Minister of ICT, about the e-government, about the startup scene, and also a little bit about trade and trends in Estonia. Thanks very much for receiving me. No Let's uh, first start with your background. You have a very interesting, diverse background. Uh, what, what is it? So my um, educational background is in philosophy. Uh, it was kind of, we, we were one of or the high school I was studying in uh, was one of the few that had philosophy lessons as well. Mm -hmm. And I got interested in that. I also got slightly disappointed with it because I thought it's, well, it should be more interesting, but it feels kind of boring. There must be more to this. <laughs> Um, and then I wasn't really sure what I wanted to study in the university. At one point, they decided, well, let's go and figure out what this philosophy thing is really about. Mm -hmm. I went there for my bachelor's degree and then liked it enough to, to continue with my master's as well. Yeah. So, that's okay, so you like big fogs, you like big, big thoughts, and you like big stories. And uh... I like asking the question, why? Um, that has proven to be quite a useful question to ask in, in most situations. And then, of course, uh, then you ended up in ICT because everybody <laughs> with diverse backgrounds uh, ends up a lot of time in ICT. What did you do there? So I started in IT support. Uh, from there, I moved to software development, from there to project management, from there to service management, from there to IT management. And then at one point, roughly five years ago, I was uh, headhunted and invited to, uh, to move to London um, to run a few uh, international frameworks for project management and service management. And then kind of um, I did that for a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, I was working with Skype. Um, after that, um, I was kind of going back to my consultancy business. And then at one point, um, I, I was made an offer to uh, to <laughs> join the ranks of politicians. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about that. Hey, what is what is software and everything and the role it plays for society and, and how it works? What is it for you? How important is it? And uh, how it has been, how has it been developing in the last uh, twenty years? It has been said that, that software is eating the world. Yeah. And we are more and more reliant on, um, on technology in, in our daily lives. It's, it's not something that is in addition to something, it's part of our lives now. But software itself is only one part of this. And I believe lots of organizations have kind of fallen into, uh, into problems with, with focusing too much on software and not focusing enough on what's happening before and, and after writing software. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand the customer, you need to, but you also need to understand not just the business aspects, not just the, the customer experience aspects, but also the ethical aspects. So you can do many things, but should you do those things? Mm -hmm. And um, we, we have the power with, with software to, to almost create new worlds, and that not all worlds are good, and not everything in those worlds is good. Yeah. So we sometimes perhaps we should take a step back and think, should we really do this? Does it really make sense? Or is there perhaps a better way to for, for achieving this mm -hmm. other than just going ahead and, and um, almost like doing it whatever at one, some point, yeah. So that's a good combination about the why, uh, the why and philosophy. And the last uh, five, uh, five to ten years, that, ha that question has been very prudent, right? I mean, of course, in 2016 with the elections coming up, uh, but uh, if, you, if, you, if we look at uh, Estonia, I mean, ba basically, they say you never should lose a, you should never lose a, a big a good crisis. Estonia had a fantastic uh, crisis, had nothing and started from scratch and rebuilt a society you know in terms of software and services in, in a completely interesting way. I think the perhaps one of the wisest decisions there were two I think wise decisions at that point which also perhaps were were mostly by chance rather than after careful long planning. One was to not just go for something that others have done before, because there were working models for banking and so on around the world, especially in Scandinavia. So we could just could have just taken the existing models and tried to implement them in Estonia, whereas we decided to do something completely different. I still kind of remember the um, uh, kind of how weird the, the concept of, of checks felt felt for Estonians, like monetary checks uh, for banking checks. Yeah. And then when I when I moved to the UK five years back, they, when I, and when I opened the bank account, they asked me if I want a checkbook. Yes. Like we skipped over that. Yeah. 
uh, and I think we that was a great, great decision to, to to make. So that was one of the decisions. And then with the the e-government and then digital identity, we made a decision for or of, of making the ID cards national ID cards mandatory, mm -hmm. which then I think helped immensely with with finding good uses for for this new new technology as well. Yeah, and that basically moved ahead Estonia a lot because I mean we're we're having we're also very dependent here in Holland about digital services, but we have a lousy digital identity, and you made it mandatory. I mean it's either provided by the banks like in Sweden, or by the government. And uh, so before we move to your role as as uh, as politicians, uh, I want to ask you when you were into the software and you were working for Skype and all these other companies, what did you think of the Estonian government and their ICT uh, strategy from the the business side? So, quite early in my in my career, I was actually working in the uh, public sector as well. So I was working for one of the uh, organizations um, under the Ministry of Rural Affairs at that point, and I was running kind of a, I was running the uh, the project management team in, in the IT department there, and then after that the software development team and the uh, the quality assurance teams as well. Mm -hmm. So I was I was kind of knowledgeable about uh, how the systems are built, and and we. At that point, we identified various issues that need to be solved, which was normal. It's like when you start from scratch, you, you get kind of these new issues, you need to solve them. Um, so when, when I came back now and started looking at what's, 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 what is happening, what has been happening, I was surprised and perhaps not in a, in a, not in a positive way that many of the issues that we knew about, well, 15, 20 years ago, they're still there. So we haven't been able, or Estonia hasn't been able to uh, kind of solve them all. Which again is like they are major issue issues. They what kind of issues? Well, in those days, what yes. were the issues in 2005 or 2000? It's always kind of so. One of the challenges was the the funding funding challenge. So with the European money, you can um, build systems, but you can't use the many money to maintain the same systems. Mm -hmm. So the divide between development and maintenance, or development and operations, in that sense, uh, it didn't really work because in re in reality, the divide doesn't exist in many cases you <clears throat> you you might be using projects or the, kind of the project management method to develop software but actually you are developing a product mm -hmm. and yeah. maintenance overlaps with development and the, whatever line you draw there it's it's artificial mm -hmm. and it doesn't really work and the handover doesn't really work so you get project managers who are stuck with maintaining the software so they become product managers yeah. but they don't know how to manage products but and also have no support mm -hmm. for managing products so suddenly you have a product that you need to take care of with no money mm -hmm. yeah. right so, so so europe has been fantastic to build new systems and and europe has been a good has, as you how has europe been for estonia but to basically continue the stuff was a problem how, but how was europe for estonia in in, in general Oh, in general, well, helpful, of course. So, joining the European Union for us was uh, was a great uh, opportunity. Um, the European Union has helped Estonia a lot. It has opened doors for us, and of course, it comes with bureau bureaucracy, and and not all the processes are are wonderful there, and uh, bureaucracy headaches and so on. But but it's there's a balance of of, of usefulness and and an annoyance. Um, and I think for Estonia, the balance has been more or less okay. So we have, I think we have won more than, than we have lost. You've been stuff. extremely effective in using uh, Europe. Okay, so that was uh, basically the, the view from the inside. No, so then, I mean, you are living in London, you're doing running companies. How did you, uh, were you already a, an, uh, an enthusiastic politician going to all the, helping with all the elections? How did you get into this uh, role? I have never been in politics uh, before before taking taking on this role, mm -hmm. and to be fair, where I was wh while I was living in London, I didn't really care about Estonian politics. So of course I observed because my friends and family live here, so I was aware of what is what is happening, but I wasn't really intrigued or interested, or I was mostly annoyed, yeah. um, and and sometimes heavily annoyed. Uh, but it wasn't because of what kind of uh, because of the. Uh, when you when you see smart people struggling with trying to do something useful, mm -hmm. and then you see other kinds of struggles as well, which are not perhaps best motivated, and you see the, the struggle in the in the, um, kind of the the country between people as well. So you get lots of questions that don't have answers, mm -hmm. and and the whole four-year um, election cycle 
where the, the focus can never be on, on, on finding the long-term answers or, or creating a long-term sustainable environment. It's, it's, it, it's kind of four years plus four years plus four years. And, and this, the cycle prohibits good, smart people from, from doing what they should be doing. So annoying. Very annoying. Now, what about quarterly results of uh, public companies? Uh, you know, four-year cycle compared to the quarterly uh, cycle. But um, okay, I can imagine your I, frustration. I, I have suffered through that as well in various companies. So I don't, I don't really like that either. <laughs> I understand why it's there, but it's, it's also not, in, in long term, it's not sustainable. Okay, so you had a normal, you had a normal attitude to governments. They're annoying. They're problematic. They're bureaucratic, and that kind. Of, so how did you get seduced into uh, going into politics? Well, I have been thinking about um, doing something with uh, with or for Estonia for quite some time, mm -hmm. and I wasn't sure what that could be. So, um, when the new government was elected, um, they started looking for new people to, to join the uh, the advisory boards for various organizations in Estonia, and I was contacted um, by one of the parties to, to see whether. I might work for a specific role for which party? Uh, the uh, the party that holds my uh, my seat, yeah. my ministerial seat. But what is it? Is it left or right or is it? It's a um, conservative party. Okay. And you were already a member of that party? No, I've I've never been a member of any party. I still, I'm I'm not a member of any party. Oh. So I'm a partyless, uh -huh. partyless politician. Anyway, so they were looking for people to to uh, kind of get closer to the party and, and, and help them to carry out what they want to uh, want to achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was pointed to, to that position. Um, and um, a few months later, uh, the position for, uh, for the Minister of, of Foreign Trade and, and I, IT became available. Mm -hmm. And they were looking for a new candidate for that. And by that time in the, in the kind of uh, society or in the country, there was lots of speculation about who that might be Yes. Because it's an important role. ICT is important, trade is important. Yeah. Yes, and um, so we had a chat, so they contacted me. We had a chat whether I would be interested in that. Um, I've, let's say I had many thoughts in a very short period of time. So I tried to figure out whether that actually would make sense. I've never been in politics before, and of course I haven't been a minister before. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how would that even work? But at the same time, what is there to lose? Yeah. Intriguing. Yeah. So I have ideas uh, of, of what could perhaps be done. Mm -hmm. I, think I, I think I know a few things about um, what could be better. Yeah. And then the kind of disposition is, is probably one of the best to, to actually achieve those things. Yeah. But it also says something about the flexibility of the party, that they are willing to accept somebody who knows something about the issue, about ICT, not necessarily is a party rescue, and, basically, and, and, and they basically liked you and they offered you the job. Indeed, that, okay. that's how it happens. How long have you been in this job? Uh, three months and a bit. So that's a little bit about the introduction. Uh, next I'm going to talk about Estonia and, and, and basically the ICT infrastructure. And, uh, and we're going to talk about that. So, uh, Kaimar, um, we in Holland see Estonia as a glowing light in the dark uh, of uh, government ICT. You know, we are used to that all the projects fail, are three times more expensive, take long, three times longer and never produce anything. And even they spend billions a billion in defense, for example, and it, it never comes to terms. On the other hand, in Estonia, they spend 10 million on a medical, uh, on a medical dossier, and it works, and, uh, and everything, everybody uses it, and it's, everything seems to go right in, uh, in, in, in Estonia and e-government. Analyze why the e-government of Estonia works, and also tell us a little bit what's really true. Of course, context is important. So whatever works for Estonia doesn't necessarily work for others um, the, the, exactly the same way. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the benefits we have in Estonia is when we develop new systems, we don't develop them for others, we develop them for ourselves. Because we know that we need to, we need to also use them. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that's part of the, the attitude or the approach uh, to, to designing systems as well. It's, if it's not you, it might be your parents or your kids or your relatives or your friends who will be using the system. You started digital because basically the Russians went away and you had to start from scratch. And you didn't have money to buy expensive, very, very uh, specialized networks. 
thankfully we didn't have the money to uh, to buy various kinds of commercial software or solutions that kind of come out of the box and promise to deliver everything including but not limited to world peace so we didn't have money for that um so we had to develop our own stuff we of course we traveled the world to figure out what might work for us mm -hmm. we experimented because no, no one really knew what might or might not work it's like we have these ideas we want to achieve this we don't know how but we kind of know what we want like we will know kind of we know what good looks like when we see it right so when we see it we know um so we traveled we learned we discussed we thought and then developed something. Yeah. You couldn't buy it from IBM or some expensive companies uh, which were all around and had all the solutions. So that's well, a theoretic theoretically we could have. Oh. Right? So approach a large organization like IBM or any anyone else where we have this new newly independent country and we want to build IT systems could you please help us? And as I said, I'm I'm glad we didn't have the money to go down that path. Yeah. So e-government now 2020. What can you do as a as a as a as a, uh, as a government person and as a civil person? Give us a little overview. There's not too many things where you need to go to the government's offices anymore. Um, of course, like if you want to get married, then you need to uh, or divorce or divorce. Yes. So, so those are still kind of paper based. So you need to you need to appear in person or buy a house or buy a house. Yes. So those are the three things. You <laughs> those are the three things you which are quite important. And you, like most people don't do those things very often. Okay. Yes. Um, but yeah, is, not too often. But <laughs> what is possible? What is possible? What are the top ten things? F well, one of the the first things which gained the kind of immense popularity immediately was was um, uh, filing taxes yes. right so which was rather than going through this massive paperwork exercise yeah. the government already knew uh, your data which they got from banks and for most people it was just click 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 confirm click done so we're very good at that actually too but the nice thing is you started with a digital identity everybody got a digital identity card which i for the first five years they used to scrape snow from the from the windows until the the tax first tax application was the first thing they used there is so there are there are various things behind the success of the digital identity in estonia and as with many other things this cannot be planned ahead it just comes together, so it's like it's the right time, the right thing, right place. So with the ID card, yes, so we, we made it mandatory for every citizen. So you might or might not have a passport, so if you want to travel, you might get the passport, but you need to have an ID card. Yeah. And we, yes, when they first came out and they were made mandatory, people were like, or some people were like, I don't, like why do I need it? Because for banking, you could use the um, codes card, right, with the 30 different PIN codes. Yeah. Uh, later on the pin calculator so you kind of for, for some of the electronic stuff you could use something else yep. and there were not too many services from the government yet and yes people was like okay so at least well it's it's um, it's credit card size so I can carry it in my wallet and yes in winter time yep. I can scrape my windows uh, my car's windows uh, when, it, when it has been kind of freezing so but but there is this element of, of convenience and there's an element of security so for, for banks, of course, authenticating people using something which is more secure than other means mm -hmm. is good. Yeah. For people to be able to use something which is more convenient is good. Yeah. So at kind of the combination of, of more secure and convenient, so you had to push from the banks and, and, and the elsewhere, uh, telecoms for, us, uh, for instance as well, so push from there and then the kind of de desire for people to spend less time on, on doing um, annoying things. Yeah. Well, it was Im really impressive that the bank said, if, if you do more than 250 euro, you have to use the digital identity of Estonia, of the government. So then it basically took off. And now you can do everything, addresses, car, education. I can look up the homework and the numbers. And everybody has this whole, this, all these things are in this X road uh, are combined. Mm -hmm. So you're now in charge of that big thing. How is it for you as an ICT minister to basically pay your attention to either the crises or the development or the funding or the new things? How does your day look as a minister of ICT? Well, ICT and, and, and foreign trade. So the, the day itself looks uh, usually very busy and, and um, in half an hour segments of uh, topics from mailboxes to space. Mm -hmm. So my, 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 kind of my, my whole area is from mailboxes to space and I, ICT is it's just part of that. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things, well, 
let's say that there's over time we have spent a lot of time and energy and enthusiasm on building world-class IT services. And we are now at the position where we have accumulated quite a lot of technical debt, as it happens everywhere yeah. with, with any kind of technology. Your stuff is 20 years old, so it needs to be replaced. It's really the old systems are slowly breaking down. Yes, but you, you can't really replace them in one go. It's like we need to repair the plane while in the air with passengers inside, right? So we can't, we can't throw the passengers out, so the citizens are there. Yeah. The plane is flying, but we need to we need to make it better, yeah. and that that is a challenge. Yeah. But luckily, I would say that we have lots of really smart people um, employed in and also working around um, uh, the government or the public service. So I, I believe this this can be done, um, and it can be. It, it, I don't think it can be done in in one big go. I don't think it's really a transformation per se. Uh, because transformation is like it's kind of you transform from A to B, but there's 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 no B, mm -hmm. right? You need to move away from from A, but it's going to be like A something and then A something something, right? Yeah, yeah. Just a little, it's an update, and but but I mean, you need to basically slowly uh, get to a new code base and isolate the old stuff and and go new one. Does your knowledge from ICT help as an ICT minister, or do you get drawn into and 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 maybe want to see too much details? You use the word or, but at, at this at this stage at least, I would say that it's it's an and, so it does help, and they do get drawn into details once in a while, or maybe quite often, mm -hmm. um, which I find is at at least for now it's it's quite kind of useful to get a better understanding of the big picture. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the overall big picture, but also understand what is happening behind the scenes, yeah. because when I need to. Um, support the teams or when I need to talk to the rest of the government to figure out which way to go. I need to understand why things work the way they do. Mm -hmm. Why do we have the challenges that we do? Uh, and it's not just, well, I can, of course I can always say, well, I don't like it. Make it differently. But this is not helpful. And it, it, can, it can't be done this way. Yeah. And You've only been in business for 100 days. So basically you need, you're still trying to figure out what you want out of it. But you first have to, have to keep it running. And then you have to move it forward. To the, do you already have a vision where you want it going? Except that it needs to be efficient and keep on working. I do have a vision where, or there's the beginnings of a vision, uh, based on what I've learned and what I've, what I've seen el working elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So I believe that one of the things that needs to happen is we need to redefine the the platform level for for government or the kind of the the digital side for of the government. Mm -hmm. So it, it's the platform is not just the technological platform; it's not just the hardware platform. Mm -hmm. It's I would say that we need to make the platform as as thick as possible, which means as thick as possible. So thick like this. Mm -hmm. So to re kind of move as many things as possible away from from um, individual ministries, mm -hmm. individual organizations mm -hmm. into this well-managed platform layer, mm -hmm. and then kind of allow the the organizations, the ministries, to develop services that are focused on customer experience, mm -hmm. based on their reviewed processes for for doing all of that. So digital transformation is not just using ICT, but also reviewing existing processes. Yeah. But to leave the customer experience and decision-making for them and take away all the headache and, and pain and, and, and kind of bother with, uh, with the platform level because... And they need to trust you that you do a good job because everybody's now doing... I mean, the nice thing about uh, uh, all these ministries, one was running Oracle, the other one was doing open source. Everybody had their own platform. They could all start and they had this little X road which keep everything together. But you want to make this thick and basically take a little bit more towards you. How, what do they say about you? They, hey, we trust you and we please, please take the headache from us. So far, the defeat... <laughs> So the idea is quite new, as is, as it is kind of my, me in my position. It, it's it's a quite a, quite a new thing. But so far, the the feedback has been quite positive. Uh, this is something that uh, kind of has been floating around as an idea before as well, okay. because there's there's various kind of um, stages for for maturity or development. So at one point, the the situation as you described. So you use Postgres or Oracle or or whatever, and someone else is using something else, and then these Oracle upgrades are very expensive and very painful. But that was how software was developed, how IT, IT systems were built at a time. Yeah. Today, it's, it's a different time. 
we have different possibilities. We have other options. We can do things differently. And we have now figured out that um, technology or technological components, they will fail. Right? So in the past, we were kind of hoping that or optimizing for less failures. Nowadays, we are optimizing for resiliency. Mm -hmm. So failures will happen. So we need to redesign the services and, and kind of the te technological stack in a way that is more resilient. And now it can be done. So I'm, I'm not saying that, well, you should have done this 20 years ago. Why were you so stupid? And I've, I've heard comments like this as well. It's like um, someone new coming in who's like, okay, so I don't like this. Why did you do it like this five years ago? Mm -hmm. Well, five years ago, what we, the, 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 decision, the, the decisions we, we took, uh, the choices we made were the best option available. Mm -hmm. Today, that wouldn't be the best option available. So we can do it differently. But we shouldn't look back at the kind of the past where you did it wrong. Okay. We'll come back then uh, when you are one year ahead and <laughs> seeing where you are now. Uh, one question about resilience. Um, security is always a big thing in 2007, the nice DDoS uh, attack. And also on your voting, there was a lot of criticism. A lot of universities are really excited to basically prove that your system was not mm -hmm. resilient enough. Um, but the voting, the e-voting is still there. I think it reaches now 50%. Uh, how resilient is it from, uh, from your perspective, your, the heart of your political system? And is it uh, already so resilient that it's an export product? Yeah. It's difficult to export because we would have to export the, the mentality of Estonians with this. And I don't think you can really box mentality in, in, in a very good way. Um, so the infrastructure we have is in, in many ways unique. Uh, and kind of online voting, the way it works for us, works because our situation is unique. And to replicate that in other countries, you need to replicate other aspects as well, which might be way more difficult to replicate than just using technology. Yeah. So that, that's one thing. Um, in terms of resiliency, so for the next two years, so essentially between now and um, the next election period, uh, the local elections, we will be looking at the e-voting system to figure out what can be done there to improve it, uh, to develop it further. Um, because there, of course... Like no, no, no system on the world in the, in the world is um, foolproof, right? Paper also not paper exactly. So we have issues with like paper voting has its risks. Online voting has its risks. So we need to look at the current risks with a fresh eye and figure out which one of those we need to address and in which way. Because again, technology has advanced significantly. We probably can do can do quite a few things better today. So you're working on that too. Okay, yeah. then let's talk a little bit about subject which I'm really interested in, and that is blockchain. Blockchain is really hot everywhere. China basically rebuilds all their systems based on it. We are very interested in Europe and Holland. We're very interested. But, but blockchain is already integrated at some part. What, what do you do with blockchain in Estonia and, and the government services? So we use blockchain or the technology of blockchain for... Um, for logs, for instance, to make sure that the data is not changed, but we don't use it for, for data itself. Right? We don't store the data yeah. in blockchain, but for log. For a digital log. signature of particular documents so you can check if, it's, if it has been changed. Um, something along those lines, I believe, yes. Yeah. Okay. Is it also, I mean, you have a, you have an, uh, so that's verifying. Um, Self-sovereign identity is a big thing. Uh, I mean, you have a good identity system. Is there also s some plans to use it in that arena that I can have an identity of myself and that the government helps me to make that? So what do you mean by identity yourself? Like well, I mean, now I basically use my identity card. Of, I, I am Vincent Evers here. I have my Estonian card to prove it. And, uh, of course, if I would have a record on a blockchain says, oh, I'm Vincent Evers, and Estonia says I am that, and the bank says that, then I have a little, then I, then I am basically, I can prove who I am without all these, I get, I get basically more secure identity because all these other parties say it's true, but I, and in the end, I have it myself. Mm -hmm. So that might be one of the kind of paths for us to look for the future. But, but the way the, the, kind of the uh, e-identity has been built around the X-Road um, with the government kind of working with organizations to prove your identity. Mm -hmm. So currently there are, there are no specific plans to, to change that. Um, but of course the system will, will kind of, we will develop it over time so it won't get stuck where, where it is. Okay. So is blockchain an important part of the technology or is it an important part for the technology for the future? I'm, to be fair, I'm, I'm, um, 
how to put this? I'm not sure I share the full enthusiasm about blockchain. The same way I don't share the full enthusiasm enthusiasm about all the buzzwords flying around because they they are taken to the extreme too quickly. Yeah, like world know. peace and that world kind of stuff. And then yeah, with artificial intelligence yeah. today, it's like a, a, any item that or anything that uses electricity is now suddenly AI. It's like it's just we, we take it too far. So blockchain, I see this as, as, as an approach or a part of, of the technological stack that might be useful for some things. Mm-hmm. We haven't yet fully figured out globally, I would say, that what are the things that um, would benefit most from this? Mm-hmm. A little bit like with, with 5G, right? The, the real 5G, mm-hmm. where we, I don't think we still have a standard for the real 5G, do we? Yeah. We do. Yeah, it is now basically in implementing, and, the, the, and, and it's now, I mean, in China they already have it, in America they are implementing it, and there is now a standard from the organization, you know, the world, uh, the GSMA is, is now really, they, they're ready and they're implementing it. But how useful is it? I mean, that's of course the next step. And we haven't figured it out yet, so it's, it's well, latency or uh, less latency, fine, yeah. uh, higher speeds, fine, but what will it actually bring? But you are, I mean, one of the governments, you're one of the few governments which already is using a blockchain to verify if information is really true around the stack. You, The moment that information is not, has changed, and, and, and then basically the blockchain will give a signal, this information has been changed. And you're the first one to do that. So I thought that was very progressive and, and, and interesting to hear what the experiences are with that. But you know, with Estonians, you probably have this experience. We don't really like to beat our own drum. Um, others beat it for us, and then sometimes we join the the, uh, the choir or the orchestra, uh, but very often we don't. So but you do it. I mean, you don't put the drum, but you already have implemented it, and you say, "Oh yeah, we have blockchain," and basically to verify, to basically make the trust level higher. Be- because it's it's just part of useful technology. It's like we choose the bits that makes most sense, and we use them, and then when they don't make sense anymore, we we stop using them. It's we're not trying to hype any specific technology. We we are very proud of the solutions that we have built, but they use lots of various, like lots of different technologies, and we are sometimes very successful in combining them, and sometimes less successful. So we need to kind of go back to the drawing board and 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 re- reconfigure. But it's just it's it's part of what we do on a daily basis. We don't see this as an, like an extra activity or something that is like super special. It's just. Modest and moving, modest and moving forward. Okay, let's then talk about uh, the the next thing, and that is uh, basically um, the. Oh, shit, what was the next? I need to have my question ready. Um, oh yeah, let's talk about the combination of your jobs, ICT and trade. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have a whole program that companies can come become startups. There's 300 recognized who basically make products and who export them. How is the ICT sector in Estonia developing itself in terms of uh, attracting companies and exporting? So Estonia seems to be like the, or in, in some aspects, it's the um, the kind of nursery for for Silicon Valley. In some ways, so yeah. the kind of people in Silicon Valley is like, okay, so you're from Estonia, okay, yes, so like we, we, we European see, Silicon Valley, and yeah. we, we we see you guys every every day. Um, although there's 1.3 million of us, so I don't know how that works, but but nevertheless, um, so we are uh, we seem to be quite a fertile ground right now for startups, um, and the environment, of, I believe, also kind of because of the collaboration between the government and um, um, kind of the the, the science. Uh, part of of of, of Estonia, so re- research, development, and so on. The collaboration seems to be pretty decent, mm-hmm. um, so it's it's good for companies to to kind of for for startups to to kick off in Estonia. Mm-hmm. The the challenge we have right you now, you make it easy, and uh, if people start a company and they get accepted, you can have visas and you can basically exactly. have permanent residence. So you basically help them, and there's all these interesting uh, buildings which are being converted to uh, startups. So that that is. Flourishing, and and we are, kind of, we are looking at how to make it even better. So the, I, I see the role of, of government mostly, at least when it comes to this aspect, but not just not limited to this one. The role is is someone who enables rather than tries to control. Mm-hmm. So how can we enable more of this this happening? So what is still missing? You don't try to pick the winners. No, because we don't know the winners who the winners are, and and in some ways. Uh, all our kids are winners, right? All our startups are, startups are winners. So we just success stories will emerge when the environment is is um, helpful or, or fruitful. 
So we just need to work on the environment and figure out what is still missing. So we have uh, discussions with startup companies. We have discussions with their partners, their customers. And then we try to figure out what else we, we should or could do. What are you thinking about? What, what can you improve? It's, so the, I, I mentioned the collaboration between um, academia and um, uh, kind of the, the startups and, and um, kind of enterprises overall. So it's decent, but it could be better. So how, how can we enable that? And then also for the government to be a, the enabler, what kind of uh, attractors do we need to put in place in the system to draw more, more startups in? So we can't compete with the with number of heads, mm -hmm. 1.3 million. Mm -hmm. We will not grow to 10 million. Mm -hmm. Like This will never happen. So when we have the limitation on how many people we have, uh, if we want to bring more people in, so how can we make that more easy? And we already have uh, international companies saying it's much easier to employ people in Estonia, uh, people from third countries, than it is in some other countries in Europe. Because for us, our processes takes a few weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, in other countries, six months. Yeah. Right. So it, it is much easier. Yeah. Um, so that's already in place. What, what else can we do? Yeah. Right. So that's also after a year, you'll, you figure that one out, uh, saying, yeah. Um, then the last uh, question, trade. Uh, if you see, so you have, you, have, uh, uh, so you have ICT companies who come to Estonia and basically uh, export products. What other, what other things does Estonia do in terms of trade? So we say so Estonia is well known for, for, uh, for IT. And for, for many people around the world, they associate Estonia with IT solutions. Everywhere you come, they know Estonia and they know, oh, ICT, which Skype, uh, TransferWise. Exactly, so which is an excellent vehicle. Yeah. But there's, there's more what we can do and what we do right now. Yeah. But to be fair, even in Estonia, most people don't know what companies in Estonia are doing because we export most of our stuff. Yeah. Right? So for instance, today, I'm meeting here with, um, with, with Estonia Wooden House producers. There's a great demand for, for, for this product here in, in the Netherlands as well. Mm -hmm. um, they have been quite, doing quite well in Scandinavia, for instance, but it's, it's kind of something which is exported. So for the trade part, there are two aspects I need to take care of. So one is enabling exports, which in my position often means I need to um, help to open some doors. Yeah. Right, so how can Estonian companies um, go to new markets? How can we connect Estonian organizations or Estonian enterprises with, with foreign enterprises? Mm -hmm. How can we help them to find customers? And Enterprise Estonia is, is, is taking care of that quite well. Yeah. Um, and then the other quite active, they're quite active in a lot of countries. Uh, I, I mean, and you have to, it's, I think the West for you is easy. What, what about the very important part of your backyard is, is Russia? Mm -hmm. How is it to basically promote Estonia inside Russia? And what do you do about that? Well, to be fair, Estonia doesn't really need much promotion in, in Russia because historically Estonia, no, is, Estonia is known as a country that produces great things. Um, as Russians used to come over during the Soviet Union time, they, they used to come over. A little bit Scandinavian kind of... Uh, well, at that point, it wasn't really Scandinavian. It was... It was no, but the same thing we think of Scandinavia, high quality, well, that's Estonia. Yeah, so we were kind of friendly people with pretty decent beaches, uh, good food, which we also exported to Russia. So for most Russians, they didn't know what Estonia is. Uh, of course, the, the trade relationships are somewhat difficult with Russia, as I believe it is with most countries dealing with Russia. Again, not limited to Russia. Any big country has, has its challenges when, kind of when it comes to, to foreign trade. Mm -hmm. yeah. How is that with Asia? I mean, uh, that's a big. Uh, okay. That's going to be the, the most important economic part of the world. How do you do? How do you work with that? So significant interest uh, for Estonian products coming from China and Japan. So Japan has mostly focused on technology and IT solutions, um, and, and China, for instance, looking at our agricultural products as well. Uh, so we have a market there. We need to develop it further. Of course, Estonia being so small, uh, it, it's not the easiest task for us to fulfill the demands uh, or the requirements coming from there. It's like even our kind of annual produce doesn't really kind of feed even one city. So we need to kind of be smart about what we export and how. But the, the, the interest is there. The demand is there. Yeah. And we need to figure out how to make it work. Which countries have you visited so far? Uh, officially, I've been in Finland, uh, now in the Netherlands. Uh, let me think where else. That might be it for now. Yeah. Well, what's on the program this year? Oh, uh, so th this year will be quite busy. 
Uh, of course, Belgium as well, Brussels. Right. Um, of course, Belgium. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, so this year, we're, we're trying to cover the, uh, the key business partners, um, or key trade partners. So we're looking at Japan. Uh, we are also looking at China as a potential upcoming one. Right now, it's kind of a little bit on hold because of what's happening in the world. So the question is when, not uh, on, on uh, not if. Uh, Sweden, probably Norway, Latvia, Lithuania, um, the States, uh, potentially lots of Canada, uh, quite likely Singapore because kind of Singapore is, is very strong on innovation, mm-hmm. and we are quite strong with innovation. But I believe that we need to learn more. Um, so the innovation focus there as well. So three months, 100 days as an ICT and trade minister. Um, how do you like it to have your days filled up and your agenda being completely full and, uh, and, and two times 80 hour jobs? <laughs> um, I, I'm not even sure whether the word like can be, can be used here. So I, I am enjoying this. I'm enjoying this because, first of all, I, I'm, I'm learning a lot. No, no one day is boring. No one day is, is like any other day. Um, I can already feel the impact of, of of my deeds or my words as well. So it's like okay. So if I really kind of if I focus, I probably can make an impact, and and kind of that desire to to have an impact that keeps keeps me running as well. The political system, the, the negotiation with your colleagues, and the political, the working with parliament, and basically being able to do some things, but a lot of things take a long time. Well, I've worked with or for um, large enterprises for quite some time, so in some ways, it's not that different. Yeah, the political debate. Okay, last question: Netherlands. You've been here now a day, and uh, basically met a bunch of uh, people. Our our, stats, our secretary, I think one of the secretaries you met yesterday, uh, Ronald Knop, and you met some uh, people from the Netherlands. What, what is your impression about the Netherlands and how have you been received here and what, what have you accomplished? So one of the things I also did yesterday was, was I, uh, we visited ESA because as I mentioned, the space program is, the Estonian space program is also under me. Um, so the discussions I, I've had over the one and a half days now, um, I, I have the confirmation that um, the Dutch people are pragmatic which is which is good. I think we can continue our collaboration and do even more of that, and not just on technology, but let's say technology as well. Uh, we are. I think we can influence Europe or the European Union to uh, in the future to to make pragmatic decisions, choose pragmatic um, ways of of achieving certain things. And I think in collaboration, when we develop, for instance, uh, digital systems, we can also show an example to other countries around us. Like collaboration works, things can be achieved. And in addition to big words, politicians love big words, right? The Dutch really don't like him. Our prime minister says vision is completely overvalued. And so the Dutch are pragmatic. what was your impression? Is, is everybody in Holland like that? Are, are we not a country of big ideas? Are we a country of totally being pragmatic? Well, I've worked with Dutch companies in the past quite a lot, so I, 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 I'm not really surprised by, the, by what I've seen so far. Uh, it's just a confirmation of, of my feelings from before or my experience from before. Uh, I can't speak for every individual person living in the Netherlands, uh, but they were all people I've talked to. They are pragmatic, and as I said, so. Big words, of course, we have big words as well, but you don't have the patience for those. We don't have the patience for those. So let's, yes, let's kind of speak the big words and, and then move to actions. And I believe that at least in Netherlands, you are ready to move to actions and, and we are as well. So we make a pretty good team. We make a pretty good team. So that is it. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Turn on the, uh, the camera.